Guys, welcome to the Pure Progress Lifestyle, where the only thing that matters is progress. Today, I'm joined by Justin Crane. Justin, you were a special operator for the military for 12 years. Now you're a fitness mindset coach, and pretty much you really help people get li their lives back. Battle depression, you know, vices, drugs, doesn't matter. You help them. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing great. Uh, you know, thanks for having me on here. It's always uh, great to get to, uh, to talk to people, and I appreciate um, the opportunity to get to talk to you and your uh, your following today. Yeah, fantastic. Awesome. Um, one thing I do want to ask is, it's it's almost like a special breed, like or not a special breed, but like it's not not everybody gets that uh, itch in their mind to be special special forces. At what what point did you wanted? You were like, I got to do this. This is what I I need. Yeah. So when I was um, growing up, I was always active in sports, playing uh, football, basketball. I really wasn't interested in school, and uh, I tried going that route. It didn't work for me. And I joined the military and I said, give me something that is, you know, athletic that I'm going to be working out. Mm. And uh, they gave me two options. One was to be a SEAL. The other one's to be a rescue swimmer. So mm. um, I chose to be a rescue swimmer and that was my, my job. And what was funny is I didn't know anything about swimming. I wasn't a good swimmer. I mean, I could float, but when I got to rescue swimmer school, it was um, an eye opening experience. And it was one of those things where I really learned about, um, you know, pride. And what got me through that school was I told people I was going to go do something and I'm going to follow through with this. And okay. um, I never gave up. I was the weakest swimmer when I first started out. But then, you know, as the class went on, um, I got better and I just kept going and kept pushing and took one day at a time. And before I know it, I graduated. And then um, that SEAL um, reminder kept going in the back of my, my mind. I always wanted to be a SEAL. I always wanted to be involved in special operations. Mm -hmm. But when you get in the when you get in the Navy and uh, the military spends, you know, millions of dollars on you to get trained to do a craft like being a rescue swimmer, there was only like twenty two hundred of us at the time. Mm -hmm. um, my path to go be a SEAL always got denied, and so I always yeah. wanted. To, yeah, it's um because our my rate as a rescue swimmer was undermanned, and so anytime I put it in a pack, you have to put it in a package. It's got to be approved by your commanding officer. Mm -hmm they kept getting denied because we needed, you know, guys to fulfill our mission and stuff as well. Cause you know, as a rescue swimmer, you do stuff out of the back of a helicopter. And my first six years was a traditional rescue swimmer. You know, I was in uh, Pensacola station, um, search and rescue. And I went through like three hurricanes down there, got rescues in Hurricane Katrina and went that route. And then when I got orders to go to Virginia, um, that's when I went with a different um, helicopter command and um so since my route was like this is kind of summing up the story here since my route got denied to be um to go to buds and be the seal that i wanted to be there was an option there was a helicopter command that deployed with all the special operations they were attached to the uh, socom community mm. and um they directly worked for them and supported them so my command officer was like i can't let you go to buds right now but i can give you the opportunity to go screen with this command and support them and, and you know go out and do all these missions with them and so i took that opportunity and when i got there there was like there was eight of us and so um i was deploying back to back from 2007 until you know 2010 supporting this mission doing this and uh it was a crazy wild ride and it's kind of um funny how whenever we feel like we we think that we need to do something there's another path that opens up and mm. I direct you to go this way. So I've always wanted to be a SEAL, always wanted to be in the special operations community. Now I didn't get to go that I didn't get to go that route and do those missions that those guys got to do. But it, you know, God or the universe gave me another opportunity where I could still make an impact, be a part of that community and do those missions that I got to do. And I'm very thankful for it. So that's how I got there. And it is kind of like a like everyone has the same mind mentality and that's what i liked about it you know there mm. was, it was like a different breed they um there's a, not taking no for an answer um it's working you know when no one's looking uh, i i got that a lot like we were constantly working on things that we know that's going to make us better preparing for because you know what different what made us different from a lot of helicopter units was they trained all the time 
in case something happened. We were training because we were involved in the fight. We were the only Navy squadron um, out of the whole Navy that was doing special operation missions inside Iraq from 2003 till like 2000. I think we left in 2013. Mm. Uh, so we're there the whole time. And so like when we were training for it, we were actually going and going and do real missions in Iraq, supporting any special operations that was spread through the whole country. So um, we were stationed out of Balad, but we would go to every FOB or foreign operating base that was um, in Iraq to support any mission at any given time. So it was really fun. Oh, that's beautiful. What um, What's the dropout rate with the rescue divers? Is it the same as SEALs? Uh, close to it. Uh, there was... I'm trying to think back. I mean, it's a, like a 70 to 75% dropout rate. I think um, BUDS is like closer to 80, 85. Um, mm -hmm. I think there was 32 of my class when you graduated with six. No kidding. Yeah. So it was, it, it, it was, yeah, you find out who really wants to be there and who really doesn't really, really quickly. They do a great job. That's what, one of the things I like about the military, they do a great job of weeding out people that don't really want to be there. Right. And, uh, that's what's kind of hard when you transition out into the, you know, civilian life is that you don't have that, <laughs> that factor there anymore. So, yeah, right. It's, you know, I, I got to imagine that's pretty tough when people want to back out of even the most simplest of things. You're like, bro, like, what are you talking about? Yeah, like, nothing. Like, but I didn't have a choice. Like you can't just like walk away from this. Like you got to own up to your stuff here. Right. What are, yeah. what are some of the um, crazy things that they purposely do to see who, who's gonna i don't know if they ring the ring a bell and um, yeah like to get up you have to you know ring a bell tell me when you drop on request and once you do that you're not getting back in but they would just constantly mess with you on a daily basis like um it's just trying to get in your mind they're trying to see how far they can push you to break you like it would be just uh, in the mornings doing uniform inspection uniform is never going to be perfect and mm -hmm. so it would constantly mess your uniform up and you spent hours the night before getting it ready for inspection and one thing's wrong and they got you in the sand doing push-ups and your whole uniform is just destroyed and this is before we even start working out then it's like okay now we gotta go get ready to go in the pool and mm -hmm. they want to inspect your your gear so we have fins masks snorkel mm -hmm. and uh so they're they're just messing with your mind because you're never supposed to give those up you're supposed to hold on to them but if the instructor asks to see your gear, you have to let them see see your gear. So you let them look at your fins or your mask. They take your mask, they throw it in the bottom of the pool, and then they're like, "Now what are you gonna do? You have to swim the whole day without like." Well, I just asked you. You wanted to inspect it. Well, like, yeah, but you're not supposed to let go of it. And um, just those mind games. We'd go on runs, and uh, we know the route that we would take um, on the sand, and they would normally zigzag up and down the beach for like eight miles. They would come back around and we get back to rescue swimmer school and someone would say, come on guys, keep pushing. We only got five more minutes. The instructor would hear that and be like, Oh, you guys think you only have five more minutes. We're just getting started. Turn around. Let's do it again. Mm -hmm. And so it's just whatever they could do to mess with your mind. But um, the way that I took it and the guys that got through, we would talk afterwards. Just remember these, these instructors are here to push us. There's only 24 hours in a day. And we can only be here for so long. So just deal with it, get through it. And if it's not gonna, it's not gonna kill you, you can get through it. And one of the things, <laughs> it's funny, I say this today still, but one of the things I always remember from rescue swimmer school is like, you're gonna pass out before you die. And so when I was in the water and I was swimming and I didn't wanna do the laps and I just felt like I was like, man, when am I gonna get out of here? Just remember like, I can keep going because I haven't passed out yet. So mm -hmm. um, that's just one of, the, one of the things that kind of got me through and, uh, when I felt like quitting, I would just play, replay the picture of me going back to my parents or um, my girlfriend at the time and saying I didn't make it. And then all my friends that looked up to me because I went and did this, I just I could not picture me telling them that I did not make it. So that's what kind of that's what got me through. Right. Now, most people would think like, man, it sounds like those instructors are being a dick and all that kind of stuff. And maybe they are, maybe they're not. I wasn't there. But, but how how important was that that you can tie into you know your Katrina your Hurricane Katrina missions your missions in Iraq? Yeah, so it kind of gives me goosebumps when you said that because they were meant to be dicks, and if they weren't, then they weren't going to be effective at their job. Right. I feel like th they were the ultimate 
accountability checker. And if I couldn't get through, it was basic rescue swimmer school training. If I couldn't get through the basic training that was required of me, if they were nice and kind of let up and told me, oh, it's okay that you didn't, you missed your, your run by one second. It's okay. That wouldn't have put the right type of mindset that I would need to go on to go to, you know, Katrina and do all this in, mm. in Iraq and do these type of missions. So what they do, what they really do a good, great job of is they can take anyone from the military, any background, any race, break you down to where you're at, at nothing and then build you up on how they, they want to create you. Mm. And that's what I really, really like. And they, it's, um, yeah, it's personal accountability. It's um, being an honor to be a rescue swimmer, having the, the, the courage to be there and doing the right thing when no one's looking. Um, because once you got out of rescue swimmer school, you took what you you know, and then we have to go on to more training, but the instructors are not there anymore. So we get trained, we get tested um, twice a year um, to begin to continue being a rescue swimmer. And it's on us as rescue swimmers to make sure that we're in shape. So we got to be, we have to be going to the pool and doing our swims. We have to be doing runs. We have to be doing pull-ups. We have to stay physically fit for when the time comes, because it could happen at any time where the, we get a call saying, Hey, you know, there's a boat flipped over and we got to go out in the middle of the ocean and pick these people up. And it's my personal responsibility as a rescue swimmer to be in shape to save those people because they're counting on me. Mm. And uh, that's one of the things they, you know, they instilled in us and, one of the things I didn't like when I was in the military, a lot of the older guys, senior guys, didn't understand the concept of why we had to do so many pull-ups. And um, I'm like, there's there's a reason why because when you're when I, when I was in Hurricane Katrina, it wasn't jumping in the water and rescuing people. It was going down on the top of a rooftop of someone's house, taking an axe, cutting a hole through the top of their house, and pulling large people out of their attic. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't have the strength to do a, a, like four pull-ups, there's no way I'm pulling a 200 to 250 pound person, you know, from their attic and getting them up in the, the hoist so they can go up. So there's a rhyme and reason why we do the things that we have to do and staying in top physical shape as a rescue swimmer was one of the things that you had to do. And um, it was something that you were prideful about. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things they instilled of us in rescue swimmer school. For sure. What the... What's what was Katrina exactly like? I mean, that happened years ago now. I don't know if yeah. some people yeah. will quite remember like how much of a big deal that was, but it that was, it was, um, it was for where I was at in Pensacola. So I was, um, it was called Pens Pensacola Search and Rescue from was there from 2002 to 2006. Mm -hmm. And then it got transferred over to called uh, the Navy did away with all like um, station search and rescues. And so we were there so, to support um, the Blue Angels that were there. And then also um, there was air crew school, um, OCS pilot school, like all the all the pilots went to train to become pilots. Mm -hmm. So we were there to support them and do, um, and just to make sure like if they crashed, we were there to, to support them. But when that happened, um, Katrina didn't affect the area where we're at in Pensacola. It, it, we got a little bit of damage, but that was all down, you know, in New Orleans. And um, my story is kind of crazy because I we were a dedicated helicopter unit and we flew H3s. I don't know if you know what those are, but they, they're they older. They're called H, H3C King. We could fit, you know, 20 people in the back of our, our helicopter. We had three of them. And uh, when Katrina happened, every helicopter unit from the Navy flew into Pensacola to get fuel and they were getting ready to go out to Pensacola or down to... Uh, New Orleans to do rescues. Mm -hmm. you would think our unit would be the first one to get called. And because of politics, our commander our, our, of, of, of our base decided he wanted our helicopters to stay in Pensacola in case, um, I don't know who was going to come, some admirals or um, congressmen were going to come and they wanted to do a, a, a tour of the base to see things. And uh, I never forget it because we broke protocol um, so we got together as a crew, um, pilots, air crew, and we were loading the helicopter up full of water. We were going to go down to Gulfport, Mississippi, and give some guys to some, uh, I think there was a 
an EOD team, explosive ordnance disposal team that needed water. Um, they, mm-hmm. Their whole place got destroyed. So we knew that if we called up the distress, distress uh, radio signal, 7200, when we're flying down there, we cannot, as rescue swimmers or a crew, rescue crew, deny someone that's in help. Mm-hmm. So we, as we're loading things up, we broke what our, our commanding officer told us to do. They told us to go down there, come back because we needed it later. But we knew like there was lives on the line and um, we had three of the best rescue helicopters. There was the, there was no H3s out. The rest of the people had six H60s and you could fit eight to 10 people. And we have a helicopter that could fit 20 to 30 people, right? right. And so we, we go down there and I just remember flying in and it was just an organized chaos because... Everything was wiped out. Um, all you see is water and then a little bit of roads and just water and then the top of houses. And that's it. And I remember seeing the RCA dome and that was the middle. And there was one channel that you would call that was controlled by a carrier out um, probably 20 miles off the coast. And they were controlling all the air traffic. So you would just call in and you would tell them that you're a Navy helicopter, here's support the rescue efforts, and then they would just coordinate areas of where you would go. And um, I remember as soon as we got down there, we started doing rescues. We got like um, 110 people rescued in like the first three hours. We'd go to fuel up and we land at one of the Coast Guard sta- stations. And the commanding officer of that Coast Guard unit came out and said, I'm taking operational control of your guys' helicopters. You guys are not leaving until I say so. So that started a huge fight between, you know, our base back in, back in Pensacola, who told us not to go do rescues. Now I have mm-hmm. this commander from the Coast Guard taking control of us and telling us that we're going to do rescues for them until, you know, they want us to leave. And um, like I said, it's a crazy story, but like how Katrina was, was so sad um, right. because, you know, there's there's people there that. I guess couldn't leave, but there was also people there that decided to stay. They didn't want to listen to the officials and they were just going to, they were just going to stay there and they put themselves in harm's way. And um, I just remember people not wanting to get on the hook. I mean, I had a knife pulled on me. I had people threatened to really throw the bottle because they did not want to leave where they were going. Mm -hmm. uh, Well, those type of people, you just kind of, you know, Act like you, you you're listening to them, but then you force them on there and get them on the helicopter and and get them out of the area because we were told on the first day that we did rescues that the water was already up to the top of people's houses. So p- the people were living in their attics, and yeah. as the night on, the water was going. And we were told that night another levee was going to break and water was going to rise another twelve feet. So the mission on the first day was to get as many people out of there as we possibly could. And um, we weren't allowed to fly at night because not all helicopter squadrons were all flying night vision goggles. Mm. And so we wanted to make sure everyone was safe. And I remember as we were leaving, you know, uh, we, we rescued a lot of people, but it wasn't enough, obviously. I remember as we were leaving, there's no power at all. But as you're leaving this uh, New Orleans, you look down at all the houses and it looks like lights are on because people are on top of their house with their cameras. Um flashlights flashing at us for them for us to come get them it, it was so sad to see because you know like we woke up the next morning and realized a lot of people died because the levee broke and we just couldn't get to them and it was really a uh eye-opening experience to to go through that and see that and be a part of it yeah wow that, that's did you guys even get to sleep or was it like you just kept going 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 yeah we like we got we we got to sleep and we would um, stay at like, there'd be fire departments inland by, by like 20 or 30 miles. And we would just fly our helicopters, shut down there and stay the night and then get back up the next morning. And we were only there for two and a half days. And then our, like I said, our commander ended up fighting and told us to come back. And we went back there and that's a whole other story, but he ended up getting re- relieved of command. Um, one of our pilots, um brother was uh, a reporter for like one of the big like new york times i think and he released the story and then the next day our commander was like on the i think it was msnbc rated the worst person mm-hmm. like the top 10 worst people in the world 
he was number one with his picture of him holding a microphone saying, you know, this guy stopped rescue efforts down in um, Hurricane Katrina to have three helicopters for him for personal support. It didn't look good for him at all. They, uh, I remember when we got back, he tried taking our aircrew wings from us. He tried taking our pilot, our pilot's wings from them. He punished all of us by making us go and do these like um, duties that no one wanted to do. We were in charge of like picking up pine cones all over the base. Or the person that was, or our pilot in command um, was in charge of like the dog kennel. It was a whole crazy story that came from that. But bottom line, we did the right thing. We stood right. together as a crew and not one of us questioned it. So there was eight of us that went down there and not one of us argued and like, we don't care, you know, rescuing these people means more like we lose our wings or whatever. Like we know that this is what we're supposed to do. This is what we train for. We have the helicopters. This is what we're supposed to do. And that's what we went and did. Right. How do you go against your creed of um, saving people's lives over like a, you know, um, an order to just come yeah. back? Like, I don't, I don't get that, but there's politics and everything. Yeah. And it was, what was frustrating is we were, we were the main hub. So every helicopter squadron was coming down and we would talk to like people that we knew and they're coming up and getting water and supplies for us. And we're helping load their helicopter up. And they're like, how come you guys are not down there? You guys have the best helicopters in the fleet. Like what's going on. And we don't know. So finally we had enough and we're like, we're the first chance we get to go down there. We're not coming back. <laughs> mm, mm. It sounds yeah. like a, a whole Benghazi thing just with the Katrina. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It was uh it was it was pretty cool to be a part of looking back at it now and um you know i'm still um i remember that matt udkow is his name the the lieutenant at the time who was in charge of our whole crew and uh for him to stand up and say we're going to do that and then you know he gets the backlash and uh he just knew that was wrong and he stood up for it and voiced his opinion and said you know you can take all like he, he stood up and he was like you're not going to do that to our guy all they were doing was you know doing what they were trained to do it was your bad call, bad leadership, and he called them out. And uh, for a month, he thought he was going to be kicked out of the military, but it ended up being right. The right people in the Navy heard what happened, and they made it right. They relieved him of his command, and uh, we ended up getting uh, awarded for it, and then uh, everything turned out great. But it still didn't matter that, uh, they, that we wasted a day that we could have been down at Katrina doing rescue efforts because of someone's being stubborn and a horrible leader. And that's where that really angers me. But, um, you know, you can only be in control of the things that you can control. So, mm. uh, but we just did the right thing when we were given the opportunity. So for sure. What are some of the, um, great principles you learned from leadership with your time in the military? Um, being accountable for what you say you're going to do. Um, mm. You know, if you say that you're going to do something and you're a you're a leader, you need to follow through with that. And that starts with me when I look at a leader, when I all, all the good leaders that I had in the military, they were in a walking example of what you would think a leader would be. You know, they present themselves well. They they their outside life is not disarray. So they have everything else in order, including themselves, which makes them capable to lead others in order to lead others you got to be able to lead yourself and mm. i feel like all the the bad leaders and including me at one point in my life is if you can't lead yourself if you can't even hold yourself accountable to do the things that you want to do and tell yourself you need to do then how are you going to hold anyone else accountable right and, um so in the military i got to see a lot of great leadership and then when i got out of the military doing government contracting is kind of where you kind of see where, you know, kind of leading without following through with, you know, without like you had a lot of leaders telling you what to do, but they are not a walking example of what they want you to do. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of a weird scenario. And I found a lot of leadership um, that happens in the civilian world, people get put in leadership positions because of their technical knowledge or background but they're never trained to be a leader. And, right. and I, there is, I think there is a, a an essence to where some people can be a natural leader, but I don't think that's fully true. You have to be trained and you have to be groomed to be a good leader. You have mm. to go through certain steps. You have to be put 
in different leadership positions to learn from, to become a good leader. You can't just be a worker thrown into a leadership position and, you know, plan on being a really good leader. I don't think right. that happens. Mm. And, uh, I think what the military does is it does a really good job of bringing someone up through the ranks and giving them um, extra leadership responsibilities as time goes on. And over a certain amount of time, over a couple of years, they, they, they have someone that mentors them and then they have someone, they have these, these duties that they're going to do that, that gets them ready for the next level. Um, they don't really just, you don't see like an officer or an, a higher enlisted person being handed a bunch of responsibility right off the bat. You know, it, it just doesn't work that way. You have to go through all this training and, and, you know, go through and prove yourself before you're given the opportunity to lead. And I feel like, and just in my experience in the, in the civilian world, people are just automatically given this leadership responsibility without any training or without any background in it at all. And that's where that I saw kill a lot of people's careers. I saw it kill a lot of companies and it all comes back to the leadership. Like if you have really solid leadership, you're going to execute. And if you don't have it, you're not going to execute. And there's going to be all kinds of questions on why these people are not performing. And it comes down to the leadership. Without a doubt. I'd even add like one, one step further is you just kill the whole, you kill your workers. Right? Yeah. I've seen it too many times. You know, mm -hmm. there's always a leader that's been there when they shouldn't been, whether that's, you know, the yeah. knowledge like you're saying, or they've been there for a while. Doesn't matter. Like yeah. it, it never fails. If people always see this every single time, if you do not lead by example, everything else fails yep. nobody wants to be there everybody's just waiting for you to fail and it's like it's not you're building this negative equity in your teams without even without even knowing it yeah yeah and then um my favorite one was you know a lot of leaders talk about um their culture and they're building a good culture a good work culture and they're they're really not they're just, they're, they're saying it, but they're not, they're not actually doing it. They're not actually listening to their people. They're not actually engaging with them. They're not getting to know them. There was so many, there was two, probably two companies that I worked for. And when I walked in, no one really greeted me. No one ever got to know me. No one knew who I was. I was just a number. Mm. And, um, you know, that's one thing that you don't, it doesn't really happen in the military. And um, it's kind of weird. I had this shift when I was in the military. I was ready to get out, um, I think. But once I got out, I, I kind of valued how important and how good the military was at creating leaders and holding people accountable. Mm. And so it's kind of weird how you see that shift. It's like uh, you don't really value something that much until you it's, it's gone. And you're like, oh, wow, I, I didn't realize how, you know, even though some of the stuff we were doing were so boring and mundane and like, why are we doing this? But now it makes sense because you see how they operate compared to other companies. Now there's great companies out there that have great leadership and I am not bashing that. It's just um, in the line of work I was in, it kind of seemed like it fell into where, like you said, you know, you just got thrown in because the company's growing too quickly. We need to fill a body. Here's you're going to lead and we'll see the, how this works. And it never really worked out. Without a doubt. What um, you talk about leaving the military. What made you want to get out of the military? Well, I was um, I was torn because I was at uh, at the time when I was thinking about getting out. It was at my ten year mark. Yeah. And, um, like I said, I wanted to go to I, I wanted to go and be a seal, and it didn't happen. And I wanted to get out, but the command I was with the the special operations command, they were not going to let me get out. So they operational, it's called an operational hold. Mm -hmm. we're at war we're undermanned you can't go anywhere so my co who was a really cool guy he was just doing his job he came and talked to me like like we that's what i liked about the special operations community is like i can talk to a captain 06 in the navy like he's my best friend because we deploy together everyone's treated equally um there is a hierarchy like we answer to but he talked to me like a person and he's mm -hmm. like look man I, I can't let you go so let's do what's best for you you can re-enlist, you can get a bonus. We'll keep you here for a year and then we'll let you go somewhere else. But right. I need you for another year. Or you cannot get the money. I can keep you here and 
then you can do what you want after that year. But wouldn't you want to get the money because they might take it away? So he gave me an option. So I stayed in. Um, and then I went, I uh, did, did the year there and I went to a water survival training. And mm. um, I taught pilots how to survive in the water. They come through every four years. It's kind of a refresher. You teach them combat first aid, pretty much everything. Like if they crashed, we teach them how to survive and take care of themselves um, in the water, outside the water to survive, to get to the nearest uh, place to get help. Mm. And, um, when that happened, I started getting um, problems with my ear. I started getting vertigo. I didn't know what was going on. And uh, I thought I had an ear, ear, inner ear infection mm -hmm. and I was going getting tests done and they didn't know what was going on. And they're like, there's no blockage in your ear, but you're failing your, your hearing test in your left ear. We don't know what's going on. You're going to have to see a neurologist. Right. So that went on for like a year and I ended up getting a medical retirement out of the Navy um, for Meniere's disease. And it's an inner ear condition where um, they don't know what causes it, but you lose hearing and it comes back, you get really bad vertigo and then it goes away. And over time, you're going to have a slow uh, decline of your hearing, which is what's going on now. I have to wear um, hearing aids um, for the rest of my life. I just can't, I can't hear that well. It's my, my really? left ear is like really low. Yeah. My right one is kind of, it's getting worse, but um, so yeah, I was ready. To, I thought I was ready to get out at 10 years, but then after I reenlisted and then I went back to water survival, I kind of, I kind of liked it again. Um, but um, being told that I had to get out for medical reasons was, I didn't want to accept that fact. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I was like, you know what, everything happens for a reason. The, the retirement that I got out, I got a full medical retirement. And then I got the VA disability and I was taken care of, you know, my commanding officer um, made sure that I was taken care of because he knew I was a good guy. He didn't want to, you know, just leave me hanging because he knew that I wanted to continue to stay in. And um, I was trying to come back to that command and also go to buds again at the same time. And uh, it just wasn't happening. And then they disqualified me from all special programs and then said, you know, you have to get out. And, um, and that's kind of where, everything took a shift for me um, right. getting out of the military in 2013. This is where I went down this long road of losing myself. And I see this happen to a lot of uh, veterans that get out that um, once you're in this brotherhood, like it's you, you, you lose it. You don't realize what that does to you, why it's going on mm -hmm. it took me <clears throat> up until probably two years ago to fully understand what all happened to me from 2013 till now and how I got to where I'm, where I, where I got and all everything that happened to me once I got out of the military. So. Yeah. yeah. What would you think the biggest, I mean, I know the answer, yeah. but what do you think the biggest thing is that like shift why people struggle when they get out of the military? Um, you lose your purpose. Mm. Right? Oh, the mm. military is your purpose you join to help and save others you have a brotherhood you know i i grew up in a uh sorry i have to take a drink i grew up uh, yeah keep going i just gotta step over here real quick keep going um yeah i i grew up with uh with a, a decent family raised in church but i never i never felt like i was a part of anything <laughs> and when i joined the military that was my brotherhood that was my family and as soon as you get out, you still have friends that are there, you know, that are that you talk to, but you lose all those connections. You lose all those people. It's kind of like once you get out, you're forgotten about. And um, all the discipline that the military holds you accountable for. You take for granted. And when you get out, you have to do that on your own. And you feel for me, I felt like I didn't know what I was holding myself accountable for anymore, because when I got out everything was easy for me. And once you get easy, the comfort creeps in and that's where all the bad stuff happens. Whenever you get comfortable, bad things happen. And for me, I took advantage of the VA benefits and I was married at the time and my wife had a good job. I had my disability. I was getting paid to go to school. I didn't have to do anything. All I had to do was show up to class and that was it. And I got my degree, but during that time, I stopped working out. There wasn't a time where I was waking up. I was just getting up and going to my class. Um, I started drinking because I was depressed. I didn't know that's why I was drinking so much. Right. And then um, over time, 
before I know it, like I've lost myself. I was in a huge depression and had no clue that I was in a depression. Mm -hmm. What I was doing, I was lashing out at everyone else because, you know, it's everyone else's problem. It's not mine. It couldn't be mine, right? Right. So, um, since I was so unhappy with myself, I ruined pretty much every relationship around me just because I was so unhappy. I, right. But I didn't know. I didn't know that was going on at the time. You know, you don't know this is happening to you. Mm -hmm. Then you know, more easy times happen for me. I get done with school, get offered a job um, with Bo it's a company called In Situ. They're owned by Boeing to teach military people how to fly drones, which was, you know, I kind of learned that in the, in the Navy, but then all I had to go do was go to a school. They paid me good money and it was easy. So mm -hmm. more comfort, right? Not having to work for anything. I would get up and I didn't, it was still, it was kind of like a purpose because I was helping out Navy personnel, but it wasn't exciting for me. It wasn't like I was getting up every day and just like, oh, I can't wait to do this. And, you know, I wasn't holding myself accountable. Right. I was a walking example of what someone looks like that used to be a rescue swimmer that got out of the military. I was, I just was not a good, I, I wasn't a person that I would look up to. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know it at the time. I thought everything was fine. This is normal. This is what you do when you get out, you know, you have a bad day, you have drinks, you know, you go to a doctor, you talk to them about it. They give you some medicine to get you through. And that's what happened to me. And I thought I was doing the right thing. I went and talked to a doctor about the depression I was in. They don't want to talk about the root problem. They just want to give you drugs. And mm. I got addicted to Xanax. And I didn't realize that I was addicted to it. I thought oh. I was just what the doctor was telling me to do. And, uh, you know, four years later, I'm sitting here like drinking almost mm. every night, taking Xanax, two things you shouldn't mix. And in the meantime, I went through um a divorce multiple jobs i've, I've ran through multiple jobs because i can't be I, i'm not happy um i missed out two years of my my son life when he was born i was just you know like i was around but i wasn't present right i don't remember pretty much anything i was either drunk or taking xanax to numb my pain mm -hmm. and, uh yeah and it finally took a uh a realization of like I'm the one that, that got me here. I'm the only one that's going to get myself out. No one's coming to rescue me. There's no one going to save me because everyone has problems. Yeah, right? for sure. What I found is like whenever I talked about my problems to my friends or family, they eventually get sick of it because they tell you, hey, you have a drinking problem. Hey, mm -hmm. you probably shouldn't be taking those drugs. You need to get off of them. But they're wrong. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't know what I've gone through. They don't know what I've been through. So how do they know how they can, how the, how can they connect with me? Right. And I was living this pity party, poor me life for so long, used to comfort, not having to work for anything that I just turned into someone that I hated. And I projected that out on everyone. Right. You know, it's funny. Um, there's this movie called skin deep. I don't know if you've ever seen it. No, but it, uh, there's a, a shrink in there tells um, dude, the main character is like, what do you tell an alcoholic? The first thing to do and the shrink says stop drinking <laughs> the dude says go fuck yourself man yeah right it and, seems and, like easy, but like, and okay, you don't stop. realize that until you actually do stop drinking and all the drugs that that is the first step or yeah. the first thing to do is to stop doing stop it because it just puts you on that path of self-destruction immediately yeah. yeah and it takes like man um for me, like I said, probably three years ago, I knew that I had a problem, mm -hmm. but you know, I would, I didn't know if I was ready to give up something I was doing for so long. And I'm not, this is not me talking bad about the military. This is just how it was back in the day, like in 2001 to when I, till 2002, when I got out it or 2013, it was in my field, you work hard and you play hard. So every weekend, if you're home, we're going out with the with the buddies and we're having drinks. We're going to right. the nearest, we're going to have a bar. There's bars here in Virginia Beach that are dedicated to guys like me where you go and drink and you have a good time. Right. And um, that's something that I just didn't give up. You know, it's something that I held on to. And I thought that's the only way that you could have fun. That's the only way you could socialize. 
And so I'm like, yeah, I know I need to quit drinking. Maybe I could just back it off, but there is no backing off for someone like me. You know, I'm either all in or I'm all out. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I would go, you know, a couple years where I wouldn't get in trouble. I, you know, I, I wouldn't, um, I could control myself a little bit, but then you can't control your, like, you can't control yourself. Like if you have a drinking problem, like I had, where I have a very addictive personality and I was drinking by myself on a regular basis. I'm numbing myself. You can't just toy with it. You can't just stop for a little bit and then bring it back in and say, it's going to be okay. You have to fully make a full commitment that I'm not touching this again, or you can continue to ruin your life. It's a really easy decision. And it took me, I think, just hitting rock bottom and finding like nothing in my life is going right, going going right. And I was scrolling through YouTube and I came across the guy, um, Wes Watson. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, mm -hmm. but he just, he just spoke to me and it gave me chills because he was talking about, you know, you need to become the man in order to find your passion again, become the man that you would want to admire and be that person every single day and then share that with others. And I'm like, and then he's like, the, the, your conscious, your consciousness is your guide. So, you know, if you're doing something wrong, you need to quit it. Let that be your guide and your life will get better. So I would, was like, oh shit. Like, and he talks about vices, like, you know, your vices, if you regret something the next day, then stop doing it. Like you're not making yourself happy. And I wasn't happy drinking. I wasn't happy doing these. Like, that's not how I got off Xanax, but quitting the, the, the drinking, which was the hardest part for me was just. I didn't have to go to rehab. I didn't have to go to a 12 step program. It was just like, wow. Like I'm, I'm, I'm letting myself down. I'm letting this control me. Am I this weak of a man that I can't, I've been through all this stuff, but I'm letting this one vice, this, this alcohol control my life. I can't, I'm not man enough to just put this away and realize the life that I want and the life that I just, you know, picture myself uh, getting to, is there but you can't do it doing this right. but it just something like something as easy as that woke me up but it took hitting rock bottom and going through a lot of heartache and pain to realize like this is what this is how i this is how i got to where i have was comfort and making my life easy and then letting these vices come in and using them for an outlet instead of dealing with my own personal problems and shit that's going on with me of why I was depressed because I lost my purpose. I don't know what I want to do with my life. Instead of just facing that head on, I chose the weak way and just went and drank and it ended up in a horrible, um, it got to the point where I was going to take my life. And, um, luckily, you know, right before you do something like that, all these things flash through your, your, your mind. And, mm. uh, I remember going to the point where I, where I was going to do it. And I had the gun, everything. I was going to go out there. And this overwhelming feeling came over me. It was like, you know, I didn't know my real dad growing up um, at all. I had a stepdad, but it's not the same as real dad. And I just started remembering, like, you have a son that counts on you. He looks up to you. He has no clue that you're going through this. And I just, I was like, I don't know if I could go through with this. And then out of the blue, I don't know how this happened, but my girlfriend at the time, at, still to this day, her mom thought something was wrong. And she sent me a message and she just said, call this number. And it was the VA helpline. Mm. And, and like, it gives me, it happened like that minute I was going to get out of the truck, walking to the beach to go do this. And um, yeah, that, that was just like, okay, there's a bigger purpose here. There's a bigger plan for me because for that to happen at the moment, she had no, she didn't talk to me. She lived in a different state. She just said, something told me to message you and tell you this. And that just like woke me up and realized like there's something greater than what we know. And if we're still alive, we still have a purpose and we're meant to be here and we need to live every day to fulfill out that purpose. And it took me a long time to figure out what that purpose was. But um, yeah, that was the breaking point for me. It was like, you know, thinking that my life was so bad that I was going to just take it you know, something that's given to us. It's so precious. I was just going to take away because I couldn't deal with my, my, 
what I thought were mountains of all these problems, but they really weren't. Right. Just, you know, I needed to get over my pity party of myself. And and it's crazy looking up from the outside, you think I would have a good life because I had I had a good job, I had a great girlfriend, had my uh, you know, my my son, um, nice car, like everything. Like, you would think I would be happy. And mm-hmm. I was even dying inside just because I lost my purpose. Yeah, dude. Lack of purpose discriminates no man. No, it, it really does. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. But I commend you on that because you know, that's one one of like been my bugaboos. Like anybody that's not had a purpose has gone through depression and mm-hmm. been in dark times. But one thing is, you know, listening to that conscious that tells you some, you know, there's another purpose, your son. Like yeah. I've seen too many people that have taken their lives, left their children behind. And it's like, dude, I mean, I, I'm not going to pretend that I was in those steps, but now you just made your kid feel like they're never good enough. And that way they may never shake that. So then they're just, yeah. you just led them right down the road. Yeah. And I, I was thinking about that now because like, like I said, whenever you, whenever you go through this, this transformation, you 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 realize some of the things you do is because the way that you were brought up but you can't be a victim to it you got to realize this is the way it is and you got to you got to attack it head on but part of the reason why i suffered the way i did was because of my real dad not knowing you know he he abandoned me and my mom when he was younger and didn't want to be a part of my life and as you grow up you don't think of it when you get older like you know when i was in my 20s 30s and 40s i'm like why didn't like what what about me you know it makes you wonder so i couldn't imagine like my son when he gets like seven or eight and be like people happen to tell him oh your dad just thought what life was too tough and he killed himself he didn't want to be around for you like i'm like i would think like i'm not enough to be like i just could not imagine that and it was it, it was me picturing him like reading a letter that i wrote or him happened to hear that I did what I did just crushed me. I'm like, I can't do this. And then getting that call at the same time, it was just like, wow, okay, this is, this is God speaking to me. And this is God waking me up. I need to listen. Mm. So without a doubt. And you would think it would be like, okay, I got a DUI in 2018, flipped my truck, almost killed myself. I walked, I walked away with it. Um, scratch free, um, you know, multiple, arrests for drunk in public, you know, embarrassing myself, all this getting kicked out of almost every bar I was a part of because I would get too drunk. Um, everyone around me telling me, Hey, Justin, you have a problem. You think that would wake me up? No, I'm not the one that has the problem. You just don't understand me. It mm-hmm. was to the point where I was hit rock bottom and I was going to take my life where if that woke me up and still I had a long way to come ended up talking to the right doctor about the Xanax problem that I had. And she was like, you just got a bad doctor. They should not prescribe you that for four, four years. And part of the vertigo issues that I was having was led to the Xanax. I wasn't taking it right. I only, I was only taking it when I wanted and I was taking it at higher doses than what you're supposed to. Mm. And so what would happen is I would take it a couple of days, not take it. And then I would have the withdrawal symptoms and it was giving me vertigo and making me dizzy. And she's like, yeah, like you're not taking it right. So we're going to get you on a schedule. We're going to get you off of this. We're going to wean you off. And they recommended me to go into a rehab for a week because I was on it for so long and taking such a high dose that I thought I could possibly die if I got off. That's how bad Xanax withdrawals are. So if you're out there on Xanax, you want to get off of it. You need to talk to professional. You don't just come off of it cold turkey because you can really hurt yourself. No kidding. Um, yeah. So it took me um, about six months to taper off of the Xanax. And then I had to tackle the drinking problem. And that's where I was saying, like, I was back and forth. I would quit, drink again, quit, drink again. And finally, it was like, I have to, I have to stop doing this. And that's where, you know, I, I invested in, this is where I found the importance of a coach. I invested in a coach with someone that I believed in. And that was, you know, Wes Watson. And, when you watch people on YouTube, you, you it's hard to like, and, and Instagram, you got to earn people's trust. Mm-hmm. My trust really, really quickly, but I, my best friend, um, he's very successful and he does, he goes to masterminds and he was a part of a mastermind with Wes. And so I reached out to him like, Hey, do you know who Wes Watson? And he's like, 
dude, he's legit. He's like one of the best guys out there. You you, know, you see, you hear a story of going to prison 10 years, changing his life right now, one of the best coaches that's out there. And um, he just spoke to me. I need someone that cuts through the bullshit, tells you exactly how you are, does not lie to you. He says, love's not lies. That's true. You know, if you love someone, you don't lie to them. Like, right. He, he, he does that. He held me accountable. He changed my life. He got me back. And then, you know, I was just like, you know what? I did all this. And now my self-esteem is through the roof. I'm so confident. I have, I'm back. I'm on fire. I want to help others do the same thing. Cause I, I see where this value could be added to help someone else's life, help change them that have been through what I've been through and letting them know that it's not the end of the world. It just starts with you taking an inventory of your life, figuring out what you're unhappy about. Stop making yourself unhappy and start putting in other habits that do bring you happy and joy mm. by not letting yourself down every day. Mm. Every single, I just realized every single time you let yourself down, you instantly go to a lower state and become depressed. Mm -hmm. and what's, or it's always the answer to getting out of that. I, um, some type of physical exercise it's <laughs> to get to a higher frequency like you know there, there's an emotional frequency chart that we our brain we, we put off these frequencies that interact without with within the universe and a low state is like being depressed uh angry sad um desiring and then higher is you know um enlightenment joy happiness love um to get to those places you have to raise your frequency. And the, the number one way to do that is working out. Mm. And that's why I think fitness is a gateway and a key to unlocking everything that you want in your life. Because if you, if you see someone that's in shape, that you know, they have discipline, they know they they've gone through some type of uh, heartache because, you know, it takes a lot for someone to get up every single day and work out. And you can carry all those discipline attributes over into every aspect of your life. And so when I see someone that's fit, that's in shape, I know that person is disciplined because you can't, you, to, to look like that, you have to be disciplined. Mm. You know, it's really, it's so easy to be fat and lazy and out of shape these days. And that's the majority of Americans. And yes. so when you see an outlier or someone that's in shape, you know, they have to be doing something different and you know, their life is probably good. Right. What What are the details that come with that? You know, because it's easier, you know, you could say that they have discipline for mm -hmm. sure, but it's not just in physical fitness. What else is there? It's within like your, it, it's all mindset to me. So mm -hmm. you have a strong mindset where you have a list of things that you do not do. Like you have these, I don't do that. It's mm. it's really what you don't do, what sets you apart from everyone else. Like if you cut out, like I said, you cut out everything to be to be successful, you're going to have to sub, sub, uh, subtract a lot out of your life. And so whenever you really want to change, it's going to be, you got to realize it's going to be hard. It's going to take a lot of hard work on if someone tells you it's going to be easy, they're lying to you. It's going to be, a lot of hard work on your part, but you have to, what you have to look at yourself and realize what is making me unhappy. It's yourself. Mm -hmm. You let yourself down when you, every single time you set the alarm and you hit snooze, you instantly let yourself down and that's how you start the day. And then that come that that's a compounding effect throughout the day. And then you talk yourself into missing your workout because you're like, Oh, I can make it up tomorrow. Well, you just let yourself down again. Mm. Um, I know that I said I was going to take my son today, but I don't feel good. So I'm just going to see if someone else can take it. I'm, I'm going to every single time you have priorities and, and, and duties that you're supposed to do, and then you don't do them, you let yourself down and then you let everyone else down around you. So how do you get back on track is you have a list of non-negotiables that you do that you do not let yourself down on. Like you, you have to do this. And it, at first it's going to take, time you're gonna have to you're gonna have to form habits mm -hmm. so your habits if you're sitting out there out of shape right now are probably you're probably you know drinking maybe you're not drinking but you're eating bad eating unhealthy you have to realize that is your outlet eating bad and eating comfort food is what's making you think feel happy but it's not you're getting up every morning and you hate the way you look so why is that because you're eating bad so you've got to cut that stuff out which are bad habits 
you got to train your mind to get rid of those. And then you got to bring in some good habits by getting up and let's just start simple and going for a walk every morning. As soon as you get up, your alarm set at 5 a.m. or whatever time you need to get for work and just go for a walk and then cut out all the soda and start drinking some water mm-hmm. and do that for seven days and see how good you feel. And you're going to start feeling good about yourself. And then over time, we add in another habit. We add in another habit. And then before you know it, it's, you know, they say it takes 21 days to form one habit. And then out of that one habit, um, it takes about 90 days to transform your life. Whether mm. you want to do that in your career, um, uh, your per, you know, personal life, um, relationship life, it's all going to take work. None of this is done by just waking up one day and everything is going to happen. You have to work at this. And uh, yeah, it just starts with um, cutting out all the bad habits and forming new habits. And once you have the habits formed, like for me now, it, it was hard at first. I right. started off. So, so I'll explain like how once I cut out drinking and I was someone that worked out for 20 plus years, I would do this. I would get in really good shape, get out of shape, get in really good shape, out of shape, just back and forth. It would normally, when I would go on deployments overseas, um, it, this is when I was out of the military um, because I was a government contractor. I couldn't drink. And there was, just, I was locked on a base for four to five months. I would get in really good shape, come home, mm-hmm. come back to my bad habits and mm-hmm. get out of shape. I would mm-hmm. keep doing that back and forth. And I didn't want to do that anymore. But for me, I just didn't want to overwhelm myself too easy. So what I started doing was I would get up, I would tell myself I'm going to get up at this time and I would just go for an hour walk. Mm -hmm. And during that hour walk, I would listen to some some type of self-help podcast, uh, book, something like that to get me in a right mental headspace. And then the other thing I was doing is I was going to the sauna every single day. Mm. Um, So it luckily wouldn't when I was um, one of the jobs when I was living in Texas, the place I lived had a sauna. Mm-hmm. And so in the mornings, I would get up and go for my walk. And then when I would come home, I would do the sauna. And I tried doing that for two to three months and just staying on that program. And then I was like, okay, I got this down. Now I'm going to add in my workouts. And then I slowly added in the workouts. And then before I knew it, um, then I got with my, my coach, Wes and we dialed in my my diet and nutrition which is it's all stuff that I knew but I just was not applying it and he helped me realize this is what you need to do if you want to be successful you got you have to have your diet in check you have to have your fitness in check you have to have your mindset in check if those three things are going you're becoming the person that you would look up to and and like you look at your idol who's your idol be that person to yourself, there's no way that you can't love yourself. There's no way that you can't feel confident. There's no way that you can't get anything you want if you're in love with yourself again. And you look in the mirror and you're like, I like this person. I love this person. Right. And, and it like, but it all takes work and dedication on your part to follow through with it. You got to hold yourself accountable. Without that's a doubt. The spot. That's the hardest uh, spot. And that's where, you know, Everyone needs a coach every now and then. I mean, you look at all the greatest athletes in the world. They all had personal development coaches. They all did. And um, it just kind of helps them hone in the areas where they're they're weak at. For me, you know, I was weak for so long. I needed someone to kind of hold me accountable until I could take over for myself and hold myself accountable. And, um, And I'm constantly learning. I think the best thing you could do is change your habits and invest in yourself first. You have to take care of yourself. If you can't take care of yourself, you're not going to be able to take care of anyone else. Mm. As a man that is a father and um, in a relationship, I have to be part of my job is to be a provider. Part of my job is to be a protector. And if I can't take care of myself, how am I going to take care of my girlfriend? How am I going to take care of my family? How am I going to take care of my kids? I'm not going to be able to. And this is like, this is something that if you're debating whether you should change your life and get rid of, stop drinking, get in shape. Yes, you should. Your life depends on it because you're going to be put in these situations later in life because you decided to put off yourself. You're going to be in these situations where you're going to be a burden on other people later down the road if you do not change yourself. Right. Without a doubt. And one thing that you touched on that I really love and enjoy is you said one habit at a time. 
And I yes. think that's one thing that people, the biggest mistake people make is they try to go, they see all these influencers online and they want to be the next badass like them. So they go from zero to a hundred, try to adapt everything that they do all yeah. overnight. And they just burn out or just break down within like a, not even a week. Yeah. And that's a lot to take into the mind over at one period. Yeah. And that's what, that's what happens to a lot of, a lot of people that I've been talking to that I've signed up and worked with, the information is out there, but it's so overwhelming. They don't know where to start. They think they have to do all this all at once. And it just, they don't, they just like, I don't know where to get like, no, we're just going to get you this week. We're going to focus on just getting you moving, get you in the gym. And we're going to, you're going to follow your macros and we're going to try to get to this number by the end of this week. And then we're going to add in some, you know, the workouts are going to be easy for them. Some and then they can do. I don't want to overwhelm them. But yeah, you're right. Sometimes it's not that we set our expectations too high. They're just not achievable. Like you can't go from sitting on the couch for 10 years, eating bad and drinking to be Mr. Olympia bodybuilder or whatever you want to be in three months. You're right, not going exactly. to it's, it's impossible. And right. so you gotta, you got to set your expectations that are obtainable. And, um, you know, like any successful person, you hear their story, it took them 10 to 15 years of hard work and dedication to get to where they're at. That just didn't happen overnight, but it looks that way on Instagram. It looks that way on YouTube. Oh, yeah. That's not, what, that's not what the real story is. Even today, like it's, it's, it's fascinating. People think it's still like with all the Instagram and all, you should be able to do it within like three years now. And it's yeah. still like, dude. You know, I, I get how that sounds and all, but still like people are not, as, some people are not as advanced as that. So it's going to take them time to learn and keep going and keep growing yeah. and learn all the habits and details and the nuances. Mm -hmm. So it's always, even if um, Wes Watson, you want to take a look at Wes Watson, how he was able to do it so fast when he came out, but which you, everybody, you know, it's seeing it, but it, it's in their face, but they're still not looking is it took him 10 years to yeah. iron those habits that he does that just does not break took mm -hmm. him 10 years yeah to do everything he does now he just walked out of prison knowing i'm a badass and i did this because he fell in love with himself so much right because he didn't have this is the thing he didn't like I'm not talking for him but he explains it he didn't have all the distractions that we have they were all taken away from him and so he had to really look within himself and he created this person that he truly, there's no way that guy is not confident. He loves himself so much because he's, he's overcame so much shit that he, when he looks at all of the problems that we see, they're just weak. That like right. for him, they're just weak, but that took 10 years of breaking all these bad habits that he had, all these bad thoughts that he had about himself not understanding why people didn't want to come see him like he had to get over a bunch of shit to get to where to be that confident to go out and do the things that he's doing and you just got to realize that when you're starting out it's okay the biggest thing for me the, for, for me to get over is why are people going to listen to me and help why would someone want to listen to me when you know i was addicted to drugs and i was in, or drinking and i had these bad habits um, and now I'm trying to teach others on how to do it. It's because we think like we're an imposter and that's not, it's not a real thing. Imposter syndrome was not real. It's you're a beginner that had West had to tell like you're a beginner. You're just starting out and you're going to learn. But over time you keep putting yourself around positive people. You keep putting yourself around people that raise your bar, raise your level. You're going to progress, but it's going to be time. Right one day at a time, one foot in front of the other, and you don't stop. You don't miss. It's when you go six months and then you let up. Mm. That's, when you, that's when you don't see the results. And that's where everyone wants to shit talk everyone and say, this doesn't work because I did it for three months and it didn't work for me. You're not in it for three months. And this is what, this is the one is the biggest thing that I want people to take away is you're like, people say they want to get on a workout plan because there's a wedding coming up. They're going uh, on vacation. They want to look good. What happens to all those people after the vacation? What happens oh. after the wedding? They fall apart because right. they, fall, they did something drastic. It doesn't work. We're looking for it. There is no end result. You could oh, even so say that about um, 
most of the people that you've seen before and afters. Yeah. You know, like, okay, let me see the photo like three months after your after picture. Exactly. Let see, yeah, let me see you now. Like, what yes. are you looking at now? <laughs> exactly. And, uh, I always, um, like, one of the things I, I always think about, he's not alive anymore. I don't know if you remember Greg Plitt. Um, he was, like, one of the first YouTuber, like, fitness guys. Who? Um, Greg Plitt. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So one of the things I always remembered about him is uh, like what separated him from everyone else. He was photo shoot ready every single week. Yes, he was. And he was on a cover of a magazine every month for, I think, I don't know, 13 years. He mm. never missed. And that's what set him apart because everyone else would go off. He was at photo shoot ready every week. And uh, I still gives me goosebumps thinking about him because he's one of the guys that like inspired me to get into fitness and it's just like, Yes. Crazy to see. You remember yeah. that that uh, that um I don't know if they make it anymore. Fitness RX. Um no, I don't think they do. No. Yeah, I re he he used to be on it. So I enjoyed the hell out of those magazines cuz yeah. always like the people he that were featured on it. He was featured on it a lot. Yeah. They would go into like, you know, their little caption, what they do, their diet, workouts. Yeah. It was just amazing and I remember seeing him on there for the first time I was like, "Wow, that dude looks incredible." Yeah. And you're right. He was like that at 365 every day. Yeah. And that's when um, like the YouTube started coming big and that's where they like uh, he started doing the vlogs and he would show his lifestyle and it was the same thing every day. You know, he didn't miss. It's just like everyone else that's successful and that's good in whatever industry they're in. They show up every single day. Doesn't matter how they feel. Doesn't matter their motivation level. They show up no matter what because they know that's what they have to do to get to the success that they want. Mm, you exactly. want to be successful, you have to show up every day. You can't mm. miss. You know Michael Phelps? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was just reading something on him, like why he earned all those medals. And he said even before he earned all those medals, he mm. trained five years in the water every single day. So if you do yeah. the math on that, he did every – 1,825 workouts straight just in the water. Mm -hmm. Who is not going to be like one of the world's best, regardless of your talent level, if yeah. you can do that, if you can hit that? I know it's crazy. And um, what I see happens is a lot of people don't really know. Like for me, when I was trying to find my passion before I got into fitness and wanted to be a, a coach and everything, <laughs> I would convince myself that you know, this job is my passion. And I would try to use um, visualiz visualization and manifestation. You can't really do that if you're not really passionate about it. Like your passion really, ha like whatever you want to do with your life, you really fully 100% got to believe that's what you want to do or none of this is going to work for you. Like mm. you can be successful, yes. But are you going to be happy? Are you going to have everything that you want? No, you got to be doing something that you are driven to do something that is your calling. And if you don't know what that is, the easiest way is to create, like I said, create that person that you would look up to. And then that's going to be your passion. Right. Being, being the best person every single day, that's what we're put on the earth to do. Right. Really I, I think number one, we're really, especially for people that are in dark places, I think you touched on it. Number one is one thing you got to do is stop the vices. It's your don't what you don't do list. Yeah. Take that out immediately. Because mm -hmm. right, I've been there. Like your purpose will not open up until you start getting rid of the bad things. Yeah. And uh, you're exactly right. And I, you know, I before I did, but now once I, I've been down this journey, I don't have the desire to go drink anymore. Mm. When I had time, it's when I had boredom. That's when I decided when I had my, now that I have my purpose and I know that I have to do this stuff every single day to be the person that's going to make me happy. I don't have the desire, but one of the things like sometimes I might have a bad day and I'm really down on myself and, and angry. The first thing I do is like, I go for like a walk run, do some push ups, do burpees. And it instantly brings you out of that shitty mood. Mm. some people might go drink so if you're thinking about going to having a drink when you're sad or down and depressed why don't you just go outside and do jumping jacks or do burpees until you want to throw up and then tell me if you really feel like going and drinking after that because i you i would almost bet money you're not going to feel like doing that after that because you 
you've got yourself out of that mode and you may have to do that a lot, but I, I would rather you have, or rather you doing burpees and stuff like that to raise your frequency, getting you out of this shitty mood than go to a vice that's just going to make you more depressed. Like, like I, I just, I hate that I did this for so long and I see other people do it, that they live for the weekends to say they want to relax, but they don't relax. Like you're not relaxing. You're, you're spending your days on the weekends drinking yourself away. And you think that's relaxing. And all it's doing is pushing you further and further away from your family, your kids, yourself. And then you got to wake up on Monday morning. Everyone dreads Monday morning. And then they're in this cycle where they're never going to get out of it. And uh, one of the things I, I learned is, you know, people say it's not all about money. And but what does everyone wake up for? The only thing people wake up for, because at a, at a certain time, the only reason why they set their alarm clock, majority of people is to get up to go to their job to make money. But when the weekend comes, everyone wants to sleep in. They don't get up to enjoy time with their family. They don't get up at the same time to go enjoy time with their kids. So it is all about the money. That's all you're getting up for. You don't get up for anything else other than to go to your job and make money right now. But right. you can change that, you know? Right. Or it, they don't even set like anything. If, if people want to, you know, I'm never going to tell people what they should and shouldn't do. Yeah. Want to do on the weekends. Fine. But at least carry your good habits in. Like you want to, if mm -hmm. that's what works for you, you sleep in, you know, Saturday and Sunday. Fine. But at least get a workout in. Get yeah. something in. Yeah, exactly. Do something productive. And and I don't want to come across the wrong way where I'm I'm judging every like I'm doing I'm saying this because I have been there I've done that I know how it feels and I know there's a lot of people out there that feel the same way and they just don't know where to start and I'm I'm telling you like getting a good uh just it's th that wall of subtraction taking the stuff out of your life that doesn't make you happy and doesn't serve you any purpose and that's one of the things that really hit home I could not think of one good thing that came from drinking. Yeah. Not, I mean, I might have a, a good memory, but I, I don't know if I really remember it. Right. You know, nothing good I accomplished came from drinking. So I'm like, why am I doing this? Right. Why? It brings me no purpose. And now, like, I'm doing things that I was always afraid of doing, like going out on the, uh, going to the beach every weekend and hanging out with my girlfriend and friends. I always thought I had to be drinking doing that. Now I remember it and I enjoy it and I come back. And I still get my workouts in. I have my calls. I'm still being productive, but I still get to go have fun. Or on the weekends, I, you know, go take a trip with friends and go out on a boat. Always thought being on a boat, fishing or pulling up to a sandbar, we got to be drinking the whole day. Like, how do you how do you have fun on a boat without drinking? Well, it's really easy. You just don't drink and you still socialize and you still have a good time. And then whenever you're done drinking, guess what? Now you're not trying to find a ride. You're not hung over as, uh, you know, embarrassing yourself, getting in fights with people. I leave from the boat. Then I go, if I want to go do a workout, if I want to go have uh, a nice dinner, I'm present. I'm there. I can go see my son. I can do whatever I want. I'm in control of my life. Right. Like you're not in control when you're doing that type of stuff. But you always have options. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's great. Yeah. Now, um, one thing before we wrap all this up, what, you know, you were in special operations, obviously. Mm -hmm. What are some some of the things that you could tell people if they want to get into special operations? What should they start to look out for, like training aspects and just who to listen to? Um, I would, yeah. So online, there's so many uh, people that have been in special operations that they can tell you. Like the first thing we're to do is like figure out what you want to do. Like what do you want to join the army? So do your research and with today's technology on social media, whatever you can find, you can read about whatever, if you wanna be a Green Beret, you wanna be a Ranger, you wanna be a Navy SEAL, whatever it is, do your research and then talk to someone that's done that. It's really easy on social media now, reach out. I mean, there's, you know, you got David Goggins, you got um, uh, Tim Kennedy, you got all these, uh, these, these guys that are influencers out there that can, you know, that can teach you and lead you the way. And, you know, talking to that recru recruiter and getting set up um, with the right training program is probably the best way to do it. But before you didn't know how to get into anything, you didn't know what a SEAL did. Now with, you know, 
the internet. You can Google, you can search, you can just do your research. There's books out there that are written, that are written by people, but I would say, figure out what you want to do and then go on Instagram or YouTube, find people that were, that did that and then reach out to them or see if they have a program or see if they have something that they offer that they can help you um, get in, get in shape. I know there's a, you know, um, yeah, even, even the Instagram has, you know, the Navy SEAL community, Navy SEAL foundation. Um, and then for, for um, Green Berets, they have foundations for that. They have their own Instagram page where you can go and you can, you can watch stuff. They have their own YouTube channel. So um, yeah, I would definitely say like, if you're interested, definitely we need more people in the military, like recruitment is at an all time low, especially for special operations. I know like um, Tim Kennedy talks about it all the time. Like they are just not having the, the qualified candidates and they're not going to bend their regulations to let people in. So what happens is now that the the guys that are in the teams have to adapt and overcome to where now where they're doing going on 12 man teams, they're down to eight to six man teams because they just they, they don't have the people. So it's very crucial for I think for our our military at this day and age that we still have kids that are growing up that want to join the military, that are able to join the military. And that comes down to the parents. The problem is, is like a lot of a lot of kids now. Are not even qualified even to join the basic requirements to join the military because really yeah yeah because last time last time i looked it um it seemed like everybody was trying to get into special forces because yeah. they, they were so qualified now because it was like people coming over from all sorts of different uh factions in the military like marines marine raiders and all that kind of stuff trying to get in yeah, that th like now, like the there's just a they the, there's people that want to do it, but like they're the the candidate pool, the people that are joining the mil there's not there's the 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 military's having to turn people down because they're not qualified. They really? can't requirements to join the military. Yeah, that's insanity. And it's because of like um, they're overweight. They can't pass the runs or they're they're just the size. It's just it's yeah, it's yeah. kind of depressing a little bit. That is the that is press. Would you recommend uh now I know like they're gonna put you through a lot of a lot of shady situations. Would yeah. you recommend people to start taking cold showers to get to get used to the fucking cold that they put you through? Yeah, I think that you should constantly be putting yourself in a stressful situation on a daily basis. Um, mm. whether that's through just doing something that you don't want to do. Now, yeah, it, cold, I mean, there's there's why programs have cold showers in them because they do suck. It does help you get used to the cold. Um, I'm a big component of, I still do saunas and then I do the, the cold plunge. Um, I love that combination because the anytime you push yourself past the threshold of when you're really, really hot or really, really cold, mm -hmm. it helps with your stress. Mm. And so you constantly put yourself in these um, pre-made stressful situations that like, so like getting in cold water, I can get it at any time, but if I keep telling myself I'm going to stay in here for this long and I do it and I get through that stressful situation, for one thing, you win your confidence, but also you are able to handle that stress while you're there. Mm. And so if you're doing that on a daily basis, doing something like that to stress yourself out and put you in stressful situations, you know how to manage stress effectively. And that's what I found to be successful at anything. It's it's how how good are you at managing managing stress if you can't manage manage stress you're going to buckle and you're not going to you're, you're not going to be able to get through the day because everything is going to be stressful to you but mm. if you can, yeah so i would i would recommend yeah um that getting getting up early like whenever you don't want to get up get up um whenever you don't want to do the workout do the workout whenever you don't want to get in the cold shower get in a cold shower like anything that's going to put stress on you and it's a challenge, do it because the harder, the harder the things you do, the better of a person and the better outcome you're going to have. Whenever you are just giving yourself weak options and you choose the weak options and you, you're choosing weak things and you get, you choose comfort, the pleasure is going to seep in and it's going to destroy your life slowly. Without a doubt. And that, that, yeah, that's for everyday life too. Cause you know, just to be successful in anything or just get anything, traction in anything. Mm -hmm. Every day, every day, you just have to accept the fact that 
something's going to suck and I don't want to do it. Regardless of it was yesterday, I felt really hyper motivated to do it. Morning comes now. I don't want to do it. Yeah. It's got to get done. But to, to touch base, I don't think I want to say that, right? So if you're interested in joining the military and you want to go into special operations, you don't have to know everything like everyone th thinks you do. The first thing you could start doing is just running and then swimming, pull-ups, push-ups, mm. setups. And so if you're wanting to go be a SEAL, learn how to do the combat side stroke. You can Google it. There's all kinds of YouTube videos on that. So when you're going to swim, doing the combat side stroke, because that's all you're going to do, and then just run. Run, swim, push-ups, setups, pull-ups. You can't go wrong there. And then talk to people that have been through it. Talk to people that have been there. And then reach out to your recruiters. They have programs now to where even before you even join the military, they have um, people that will work with you to get you into the shape that you need to get into, but even before you even get to boot camp. And then after boot camp, while you're in boot camp, you're going through special training to, to get you trained to go through that um, that program that you signed up for. What about just, uh, another thing I would say is like, make sure if you sign up with the recruiter that you have a contract, don't let them talk mm. you into joining the military. And then say, when you get to your first command, you're going to be able to sign up, have a contract saying that I'm going to go to buds training or seal training after I graduate boot camp or after I join the army, I'm going to, I'm on a contract to go be um, a, a SF or ranger. It's not on con it's not on paper and on contract. They're lying to you. They're just really? trying to get Yeah, yeah. you I've I've had a lot of people that have done that. They they tried kind of doing that to me when I signed up. But um recruiters, they're they're great. They're they're trying to get numbers, they want people in. But um if they have like a rate that's really, really low or a job that's really, really low in the military and they need to get those numbers up. They're going to get people and they're going to sign up and they're going to try to get you to go to that. They're going to try to talk you into doing something that you might not know. And so if you just want to join the military, you could end up on a, like the Navy, you could end up on a, a, a carrier somewhere as an undesignated sailor and not have any job for like two years. Wow. That's, that's a little suspect. Yeah so, yeah. so just make sure that you're signed up for something that you want to do. Wow. And if, that's... And if they don't want, if they want to tell you no, then go to a different recruiter. Mm. to the recruiter that if you want to join the Navy and you want to be a SEAL and you, you, you meet all the qualifications. If one recruiter tells you, you can't do that because they don't have the spots for it, then just go to the next recruiter and keep going until you get the answer that you want. Don't stop. Yeah. Really? That's, yeah, I mean, that's you, important. That is important for sure. Yeah. I mean, you heard, um, I don't know if you listen to David Goggin's story, but when he wanted to join to be a SEAL, he was a hundred and some pounds overweight. Every recruiter told him, no, we right. can't sign you up. No, we can't sign you up until we found one that said, if you can lose the weight, I'll sign you up. So he lose, lost the weight and he signed up. So, but if he would have listened to the first six recruiters, he wouldn't have done what he did. So um, just realize like, for me, like not everyone would be on your side. Not right. everyone's going to have your best interest in mind. So you have to be looking out for yourself. So I'm not saying the recruiters are bad. I'm just saying like, just if there's something that you want to do and you want to join the military to be a SEAL or a Green Beret or a Ranger, don't take no for answer. Like if you're physically qualified for that position, you should be able to sign up and have a contract stating that I'm going, I get a chance to go to the school before I do anything else. Now, if you go to the school and you drop out, then you're at the needs of the Army or the Navy or Marines. But at least you were given the opportunity right. chance first. Mm -hmm. You don't do that. You're going to join the military and you're going to go in, you're going to go out to somewhere and then you're going to have to try to get to that school. So that's what they're going to do. So just make sure you have the contract. Mm -hmm. Makes a lot of sense. Yep. Um, do you know, are you coaching full time? Is that what you do now? Yeah. So I, I walked away from my uh, about you know, four months ago and I just focused on this um only and this is my full-time job this is what i want to do um, for the rest of my life and uh i'm not going to stop until yeah i'm not going to stop like i'm not i'm not this is something i'm going to do i have the support from my family and this is this is the life that i've chosen this is what i want to do and my goal is to be able to help as many people as i can save themselves from themselves love it love it where can people find you at 
Um, I'm on Instagram. So it's uh, Justin Crane underscore fit. And that's my Instagram handle. And so that's, uh, that's where I do everything from is from Instagram. So awesome. Well, you heard the man go visit Instagram, sign up you guys. Will be t well taken care of. Justin, I appreciate you coming on brother. Yes. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure talking to you and getting to know you, man. I appreciate it. Absolutely, man. Have a good day. All right. You too.